the Prophet Muhammad was with one of his companions. He basically invites this companion over to his house uh, where Aisha was. And when they got over there, uh, the uh, Prophet asks Aisha to bring out food for them. And uh, then Aisha brings out uh, something which is called hashisha. My dear brother Taymur. It's good to have you here. It's so good to be here with you. Good. So today we want to talk about a uh, another controversial topic, and it is about intoxicants. Okay. We're going to touch up just a little bit on the alcohol in the beginning, but we'll have an episode that has to do with that later that specifically deals with alcohol. But today our focus is going to be basically uh, those substances that are widely referred to in Western society as drugs. Mm -hmm. So basically, uh, most types of uh, drugs are outlawed or are regulated by governments, right? Yes. Uh, so you have uh, pharmaceutical companies that, um, you know, produce uh, certain types of medicines or drugs, and that's why you have drug stores. And then you have other uh, types of uh, plants uh, that also cause effects on the human body, uh, but are not being used by these pharmaceutical companies. And mm -hmm. so uh, the ones that are not being used by the pharmaceutical companies, the governments tend to uh, outlaw mm -hmm. and say that it's illegal uh, to have, and they tend to punish you uh, with imprisonment or, uh, you know, fining you or whatever else is the case, uh, depending on the country. Although there are some countries like uh, the Netherlands, uh, uh, the United States and some states that have, uh, you know, allowed uh, certain types of drugs to be legal for uh, recreational uses yes. or usage. We're not uh, so much interested in talking about it from a uh, government perspective uh, because uh, the governments, uh, they're working with man-made laws. Mm -hmm. um, and so these laws are based on you know, uh, what the people in that society uh, consider to be harmful uh, to its citizens or, um, you know, beneficial. And then they draw up laws based on that after the debate. And so really it's the rule and the supremacy, it's the regulations of the people. And uh, that is not something that we're so much interested in speaking about. And it has nothing to do with us because our interest is in uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, his stance towards things. We're speaking about it from a religious uh, perspective. What is God's opinion on uh, drugs in general? Does God regulate it in any sort of way? Right. We know that um, the origin of drug regulation uh, by the scholars of Islam. So in Islam, uh, also, uh, most of the sects of Islam consider most, not all, but most of them consider that drugs are haram and they have issued fatwas about it being haram. And it's important to understand where does this verdict come from? Okay, because when, when you use the word haram, there's haram and halal in Islam. Halal is the equivalent of kosher or the what it means is basically that God has made it permissible. Haram means God has forbid it. Anything that you do that's haram, it means you're violating God's laws and therefore uh, you can be punished. You, you uh, can go to hellfire or or, uh, you know, God's anger will be upon you as to where those things that are halal, that are permissible, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's okay, you're allowed uh, to use those things, yes. okay? Mm -hmm. So the origin of the verdict of drugs being haram comes from the period where the Prophet Muhammad basically outlaws alcohol. 
Yeah. And initially, in, uh, during the life of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, there was a period where alcohol was not yet forbidden. And then there was the period where it was forbidden, and that was after a verse from the Quran came down forbidding it. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason uh, why it became forbidden is because uh, the Arabs at the time, they were abusing the alcohol. Um, there were women that were walking around uh, naked. People were, um, you know, fighting with one another. And they were also coming to the prayer uh, while they were in a state of being drunk or intoxicated. And so the verse comes down and don't approach prayer while you are intoxicated. And uh, verses came down which uh, clarified that, you know, there, while there are benefits uh, in wine, uh, its harms are more than its benefits. And it's speaking about its harm to society, mm-hmm. right? Uh, because people, when they're in a state of being on alcohol, uh, when they're intoxicated, uh, when they're drunk, uh, they tend to do things that they wouldn't do uh, when they're not drunk or they're not intoxicated. So, and everybody knows this, people, uh, you know, they they might uh, commit uh, sexual violations or, or do things that they normally wouldn't do. They might sleep with somebody uh, that's that's not their wife or not their husband and and also they might become aggressive and fight with one another so um, the alcohol became impermissible uh, the arabs at the time they didn't know when to stop prophet peace be upon him and his family stops it becomes haram during the sixth covenant mm-hmm. then there uh, was a hadith uh, in which one of the companions basically states uh, and narrates that the Prophet Muhammad forbade all types of intoxicants. You know, so uh, to to you know, and basically what they were saying is that is that you know all the forms of alcohol were forbidden. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the word that was used in the narration was the muskir or something which causes drunkenness yes. okay mm-hmm. uh, because the sukr is drunkenness and so muskir is that which causes drunkenness yes. and so they understood it then the scholars understood that which causes drunkenness they translated it as intoxicant mm-hmm. and then they applied it to all other things which cause somebody to be in an altered state of consciousness and then on that basis they stated okay well um also hashish uh, hash uh, marijuana cannabis all these things uh, heroin uh, cocaine uh, they all cause you to be drunk you know because they all alter your consciousness so they equated it with drunkenness and therefore, uh, they issued fatwas that all of these things are actually haram. Mm-hmm. But there are no hadiths where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and this is very important for the viewer to understand, uh, because uh, you know we as believers uh, in the supremacy of God and followers of a particular religion, we believe that we should not follow any decree except if it comes from God Almighty. Uh, so we don't believe that um, you know men can uh, make laws that are legally binding uh, with God and, and that if we don't obey it, that uh, we go into hellfire or, or uh, you know, uh, can be punished except if that man who is making these laws uh, comes from God, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, there are no narrations uh, where the Prophet Muhammad forbids the usage of any uh, type of plant, mm-hmm. okay, or fungus or any, any type of substance that uh, causes an altered state of consciousness. Okay. All right. Yeah. So it's important to understand that the origin of this tashriya, mm-hmm. of these these this this forbidden uh, of these plants, comes from the scholars who are using the word to make a blanket judgment over all types of uh, you know mind altering substances. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes. 
So they say a muskir is a mughayyib lil aql or you know that which causes drunkenness is that which makes your mind uh, in an altered state and therefore there's other things that make your mind in an altered state so therefore uh, all these substances are substances that call, cause drunkenness. Mm-hmm. All right? So it's a mistranslation. It's or... a mistranslation and it's kind of like a slick uh, application uh, of the word and the concept without um, you know uh, without too much uh, evidence, really, or or, or too much uh, substance to their claim. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now, uh, in order to really solve this issue, we got to go back, uh, Taymor, as we always do. Um, you know, the Quran, it validates the previous prophets and messengers that uh, came from God, and it also uh, validates the, the Torah, uh, the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament. So uh, we got to go back to the origin and see uh, what does God say about that. And in the beginning in the book of Genesis, what we find is that God grants man in the very beginning. He grants Adam. um, He says to him, I am going to give you every, every seed bearing plant on the face of the earth as food for you. Okay. And also every uh, tree that has fruits that are seed bearing okay Okay, so that's really really important and it's really specific Mm -hmm. so god's telling adam uh, and mankind that it's halal for them it's permissible for them to eat two things all right and nothing else Mm -hmm. all plants are food for human beings Mm -hmm. okay so long as they have seeds yes so what are some of the plants that don't have seeds? Well, some of the plants that don't have seeds that wouldn't go into this category then uh, would be uh, like the moss. Okay. Okay? Because mm-hmm. moss has, a lot, has spores in, yes, instead right. of spe- uh, seeds. Yeah. And the same thing would be true of mushrooms, for example. Okay. They have spores and they don't have seeds and we know that a lot of the mushrooms are also uh, deadly uh, if a person eats it he dies they are not part of this seed bearing plants that were given to mankind um, you know as a food but one of the plants that is seed bearing is the marijuana plant the mm. cannabis plant mm-hmm. you know yeah. and so because cannabis has seeds then we know without a shadow of a doubt based on genesis if we believe in the hebrew bible that god had given cannabis as a food for mankind just like he gave all of the other plants Mm -hmm. makes sense (laughs) trees uh, that did not bear uh, fruits that had seeds were forbidden and so that means that basically all of the apple trees they were acceptable and they're given as as food the <clears throat> uh, pear trees mm-hmm. right and all other fruit trees that have seeds they're allowed but some trees they don't bear uh, basically uh, fruits that have seeds like ferns for example or something mm-hmm. like this you know right. or they don't um, they wouldn't be given um, uh, as food understood yeah understood mm-hmm. it's clear okay Then when we move along to the second uh, covenant, uh, which is the Noahic covenant, God expands things a little bit and adds on to those things which he gives to mankind as food, not just these plants, but he also grants for them uh, animals. Every living thing that moves on the face of the earth Uh, God allows it. So all animals were allowed and made permissible uh, for mankind uh, to eat. And when we go down to the fourth covenant, and that was the covenant with Moses, uh, we find something really interesting uh, takes place. And that is that uh, they are out in the desert 
and God gives them a special food that he didn't give to uh, all of the prophets and the messengers that came before. He gives it to Moses and he gives it to the Israelites. And mm. it's something which is mentioned in the in the uh, Hebrew Bible. And it's also something which is mentioned in the Quran. Mm. And that is this substance that's called manna, yes. right? And man. And this manna that's given uh, to Moses, it's it's kind of a substance that most people, um, you know, have not known what it is exactly. You know, it's this food that has come down from the heavens, and mm-hmm. it's described as this 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 thing, these wafer type uh, wafer type substance, right, or food that the Israelites would wake up and they'd find it like all over the mm-hmm. ground, right? It just uh, you know appeared on the ground or grown from the ground mm-hmm. and it, it's only when we go into the hadith of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi later on in the islamic traditions uh, that we find that the prophet actually identifies exactly uh, what the manna is and the manna uh, the prophet muhammad says in one hadith he says that uh, in truffles uh, in the water of truffles is a cure for your eyesight. Okay. And then he says, and truffles were a part of manna. Wow. Okay. Wow. So now it's done. We have the prophet. He's stating that manna, one of the forms of, of, of manna was truffles. Well, what is, what is truffles? Truffles is, is a fungus. It's the same thing, uh, like mushrooms. So obviously mushrooms and truffles were the manna and they grow on the ground and they're wafer like substances um and there are many types of truffles now uh, that are considered to be delicacies and many types of mushrooms now that jews christians and muslims they eat in their foods and uh, we also know that there are a group of truffles and a group of mushrooms uh that uh, that its water does cause cures for the eyesight, uh, you know, and there's uh, like trachoma uh, that's caused by chlamydia uh, and uh, infections in the eye. The water uh, from the truffles, it can cure that. And we also know that on a spiritual or esoteric sense, mm-hmm. um, there are mushrooms and truffles that c- contain a substance that's called psilocybin and uh, psilocybin uh you know is a substance that causes uh hallucinogenic type of uh effects uh in the human being and it is a uh, type of medicine uh, that cures the soul or the 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 eye of the soul itself okay it okay. opens the eye it opens the... the eye and it induces visions okay right? the yeah. eye of the spirit wow so now we know that that you know cannabis was allowed okay and and uh, the the opium plant or the uh, you know that, the poppy seeds the flower. poppy seeds all of these plants that have seeds now uh, that cocaine is made from heroin is made from cannabis is made from uh, these were already given uh, to mankind in the beginning and then we know now that the funguses are also included in these plants that are given to uh, man later on uh, during the mosaic covenant mm-hmm. And uh, they were never forbidden by any prophet or messenger, uh, you know, since uh, that time. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Another interesting thing is that in the Hebrew Bible, uh, they had uh, certain instances that were being burnt and things, substances that were being burnt in the temples uh, as offering uh, offerings to God. And... Uh, certain things that would be rituals that would be carried out by priests um, when they would go into the temple in order to uh, receive the word or the revelation of God. And they found uh, recently, and there's been a lot of articles that were published about this, when they, uh, they found in these temples, on the altars, where these offerings were presented and burnt uh, they found in there the residue of animal dung and things of this nature but they also found on there the residue of marijuana cannabis 
Okay? okay, and that proved for them that uh, marijuana was being used in the Jewish temples, um, you know, thousands of years ago. Wow. Uh, we also have in the Hebrew Bible uh, this oil that was being used by uh, the prophets and the messengers. Uh, it was used by Jesus. It was used by uh, the priests in the temple. And it was used to anoint uh, any king uh, that was appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you have uh, an, an ingredient list. Like it, it states the different ingredients that you put in there. Uh, cinnamon, mirror, different uh, substances like this. And then there's one substance that's mentioned in there. And that uh, modern day scholars have stated that this is actually cannabis. Okay. And that's the substance, the, this unknown substance that's placed in the oil. Okay. Okay. Wow. And the idea is that uh, after the, the, the priest or the king or the prophet would use this oil to anoint themselves that the, it would, it would be absorbed, that the cannabis would be absorbed, uh, by the skin and it would, uh, cause the person to be in this altered state whereby he would become, uh, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. We have in Islam, now, uh, interesting hadith. The Prophet Muhammad was with one of his companions. And, and one of these companions was a uh, member of a group of the people from the Muhajirin and the Ansar that did not, um, you know, have a spouse and uh, or uh, that they did not have a home. Mm. And uh, he basically invites this companion, the companion's narrating that his father was one of these people and that the prophet invited uh, his father over to his house uh, where Aisha was. And when they got over there, uh, the uh, prophet asks Aisha to bring out food for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Aisha brings out uh, something which is called hashisha. Okay. And then they consume the hashisha. And after they consume the hashisha, the narration states that it seems like they are still hungry. Mm -hmm. And so the prophet asks for uh, Aisha to bring out uh, a different type of food. And then she brings out the different type of food after that. And then they eat that. And then it says that they became thirsty. And so they ask uh, Aisha to bring back, you know, bring out something for them to drink. So she brings out something for them to drink. And then it says that they were still thirsty. And so she goes back and she brings out more for them to drink. And then she brings it out and they drink it. And then after they drink it, uh, the prophet then turns to his companion and he says to him, and now if you want to spend the night here, you can spend the night here. And if you don't want to spend the night, then you can spend the night in the masjid. It's up to you. Mm. Uh, so here they're eating this thing called hashisha. Uh, they become really hungry. They become really thirsty. And then the prophet uh, tells the man, hey, it's up to you. If you want to crash here tonight or you want to sleep here tonight, you can if you want to go. Uh, to the masjid, uh, you can also do that. And then it states that the companion then like laid down and he was laying on his belly, like flat on his face. And then all of a sudden he felt somebody moving him uh, with his leg. And the uh, it was the Prophet Muhammad who was telling him that basically God does not like that. Uh, they lay like that in, uh, in, on, the on his belly in that way that the man was, in the manner that the man was laying. On the authority of Ya'ish ibn Tufat al-Ghifari, who said, My father was one of the people in the Sufa. The Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Come with us to the house of Aisha. So we went, and he said, Give us food, Aisha. She brought hashisha, and we ate. He then said, Give us food, Aisha. She then brought haisa, the size of a pigeon, and we ate. He then said, Give us something to drink, Aisha. So she brought a bowl of milk, and we drank. Again he said, Give us something to drink, Aisha. She then brought a small cup, and we drank. He then said, If you wish, you may spend the night here, or if you wish, you may go to the mosque. He said, While I was lying on my stomach in the early morning, a man began to shake me with his foot, and then said, This is a way to lie down, which Allah hates. I looked and saw that he was the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. So, 
uh, the scholars, what they do is they disregard and they don't explain what this hashisha was uh, that they were eating and they disregard uh, this hadith and, and how uh, there was this focus given by the companion that narrated like all these different foods and drinks right. that kept coming out. Uh, uh, and they just focus and they put it into the door of hadith that speak about how uh, you shouldn't sleep on your on your belly. Okay, so that's an interesting hadith, and the so reason why it's interesting is because of the usage of the word hashisha, because that is the exact same word uh, that they uh, use today when the Islamic scholars are speaking about uh, how uh, marijuana is haram or it's a forbidden substance, right? And right. or or why hash is a uh, forbidden substance. Uh, so there's that hadith. There's also another hadith in which the uh, series of hadiths actually in which the Prophet Muhammad is speaking about uh, the harmala or mm-hmm. the harmal seeds, mm-hmm. right? That comes from the plant. And uh, he speaks about how appointed over each one of these seeds is an angel. And okay, so there's this spiritual uh, element. Uh, there's this, this, this connection between this plant mm-hmm. and between beings from the other side that's being established here. Mm-hmm. And not only that, but it was said by the Prophet Muhammad that this plant, um, this seed, uh, it, it has properties to expel, uh, when ingested or burnt to expel uh, shayateen. And that's why in the Middle East they use it uh, to kind of like exercise an area uh, from demons. They use it as a type of bukhur or a type of uh, incense. But what's interesting about about this seed that the, the Prophet Muhammad says gives wisdom or that it expels uh, demons or that there's angels that are attached to it and guarding over it is that this, uh, this seed, it actually contains in it uh, one of the uh, key uh, substances that is needed to make ayahuasca and also in it and of itself it has hallucinogenic uh, properties and that's why back in the ancient Zoroastrian uh, religion uh, they would burn uh, a lot of these seeds Uh, in a room in order to cause the smoke that the priests would inhale or the people that were present would inhale and that would cause them to uh, have like hallucinations or uh, communications with uh, spirits and angels or or with the other side. And the Prophet Muhammad certainly did not uh, in any way, shape or form uh, forbid this plant or any other plant. It seems like he uh, promoted it. He actually did promote it. Subhanallah. It's, um, it's as if they shut the, these doors that are were put there to help us have these experiences. Yeah. So what we what we were trying to demonstrate uh, through our talk now was two things. One is that uh, God gave uh, two human beings. He authorized them mm-hmm. uh, to use as food. Um, and to work with and ingest and, and he gave them full reign over these plants, which included, uh, cannabis and, and, uh, these other hallucinogenic and, and, uh, drug, uh, so quote unquote drug plants. Mm-hmm. And the second thing that we wanted to demonstrate is that the Prophet Muhammad never forbade them, nor did any other prophet or messenger forbid them. And so Ahmed al Hassan uh, the Amani and the uh, vice chairman of Imam al Mahdi, uh, he states that the, the cannabis plants, uh, marijuana, uh, cocaine, heroin, all of these substances, he says that they were never forbidden and they were never made haram by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. And he also stated that marijuana specifically, there was no prophet or messenger that ever came to the earth except that they used it. And that God did not will goodness for any human being except that he caused them to at least try it at some point in time. Okay. 
And he calls uh, these, these plants, these substances, their effects, especially uh, DMT. He states that DMT is the opening uh, between the realms. Mm -hmm. It is that substance which uh, connects the world of the spirits, uh, the world of the angels, the world of the jinn, the hereafter with wow. the current world. Mm. And there's many books that were written about uh, DMT mm. and many people have spoken about it and have talked about how uh, DMT is the same substance that causes a person to, it's released naturally by the brain and causes a person to have visions when they are asleep. It's what causes a person to dream and that mm. when a person dies, it's also the substance that is uh, released uh, heavily uh, in the brain. Wow. So uh, that is our stance uh, on these plants. Our stance is that uh, they were forever used by the prophets and the messengers uh, from the very beginning of time uh, up until today and, and the imams and that they were never forbidden and they are not substances that cause drunkenness uh, therefore they were not forbidden or included in the forbiddance uh, uh, when it when it came down in regards to alcohol uh, in the time of the prophet muhammad but at the same time uh, we do uh, the, the the imam islam uh, warned though uh, that uh, that some people do uh, use it in certain ways that causes them to uh, basically to cross over into these other realms their soul or their consciousness goes uh, over to these other realms and their spirits are unable to uh, find its way back uh, into its body or into this world and for that reason he uh, basically said that a person should obviously exercise caution mm -hmm. and also we don't uh, promote the breaking of any laws uh, not because we are uh, saying that a person is obliged to obey man-made laws uh, but because of the fact that uh, you know anytime a uh, a person uh, breaks the laws of the lands that they're in, um, they could expose themselves to danger, including imprisonment. Mm -hmm. And we don't wish that for uh, any of the believers uh, that they uh, end up in jail because of the uh, usage of these substances. And, and, and so the responsibility lies on the uh, individual if he or she chooses to use these substances uh, they have to, um, you know, be aware of the risks and uh, be aware of uh, the intention behind the usage uh, of the plant. And uh, they have to exercise caution. And we just sought today to answer the question of whether or not it was a sin with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether or not it's haram. And what we find is that it is the total opposite of that. Yeah, uh, really. But rather, they are substances that allow a person to communicate with um, the, uh, uh, the other world, but that they were always used um, in moderation within the framework of a ritual that was taking place in the temple or a special occasion mm -hmm. uh, whereby the purpose behind its usage uh, was to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, this is such a fascinating and eye-opening uh, topic. And uh, thank you so much for making that clear for everybody. Thank you so much, Taymar.